Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to um, our program on the markets and uh, updating on what's world events are going on. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We will be recording today so we can share that with our clients later. Um, we're lucky enough to have Bert White um, for a second time in, in a year. I'm pretty excited about that uh, to, to share his views. Uh, I'm sure you're going to find that he is a, an amazing speaker who never disappoints, no pressure, Bert, oh and uh, will give me garbage most of the time we've known each other. Uh, so thank you very much for all of you joining us. Uh, we have right now, everybody is muted, um, but uh, we will have a time for questions and answers at the end. They're not, we won't be able to do that today, okay? So, but thank you all for joining us. Eric, why don't you take over? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, hold on. There we go. Thank you for joining us today. And again, we are very, very happy to have Bert. Again, he's one of our, our favorite people, one of the best speakers that, uh, that we know. And we're very lucky to have him here to share some of the, uh, I don't know, goings on in the world. And, and probably for, for um, all of you, there'll be some familiar thoughts. And although it may not exactly parallel all thoughts, our thoughts, I'll bet it'll all rhyme. And Bert is the Managing Director and Director of Investment Solutions with LPL Financial, which, as all of you know, is the leading independent broker dealer in the country. So not too shabby and uh, a friend and an all around good guy. Uh, so without, uh, again, we are just to remind you again, we are uh, recording today's uh, call to hopefully put it up later for those who couldn't join today. And we'll have a probably a tight uh, 30 or 40. If anybody does have any, any questions that they'd like to maybe email to Carla or myself, we will do our best to look at them offline and maybe pass along a few of those if we do have any time Great, at the yeah. end. And you can always follow up with us afterwards for any, any questions that you may have. And so without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to, to Bert White. Thank you so much, Bert. Hey, thank you. Uh, it's great to be. I can't even believe I agreed to do two of these uh, in a year for you, Carlo. <laughs> uh, I can't even, somehow there was a loophole in there. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here and I'm going to pull up a, uh, a presentation so you don't have to look at my face, uh, which uh, that would, that's going to be good for everybody, trust me. Um, and we'll get the slides going here. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the markets. Um, we're going to dive into this and one of the things I, I, uh, I've titled this passing of the baton. Uh, here's what I mean by that. Um, just like in any race, uh, you've got different runners in a relay. Um, what really drives our economy and what has been driving our economy is stimulus that has come from the government, whether it be really low interest rates uh, or whether that be stimulus that's coming from, um, uh, you know, uh, COVID relief and things like that. But what's happening here recently is that now that baton's being passed to somebody else. The government is not going to be doing nearly as much as it did before. In fact, you might actually see that to be a slight negative, likely to see taxes increase and other things. But then also, the Fed is beginning to raise rates. So what does that mean? The baton is being passed now uh, to consumers, that is all of us, and business owners um, to really drive economic growth going forward. So we're going to talk a little bit about that now. Lots of stuff going on in the markets. I'm going to talk about my three eyes. But before I get to that, um, I think sometimes we think the, the last few months that have been so crazy and so much going on, and really my three eyes, we'll get to that in a second. Um, one thing I do want to do is to just talk a little bit about how good the last year was. Um, sometimes we forget about that. We get so focused on the short term that we miss this. This is one of my favorite charts here a lot of lines, uh, but let me tell you what this is. Every one of those colors is a period of time where the market came out of a recession. Uh, so for example, look at the green line. That green line is when the market came out of a recession from um, the Great Recession. Um, so remember 2008, 2009, that really tough period. And what you're looking at is how long did it take for the market to double off of its bottom? So in other words, once it sort of stopped uh, going lower and it began to move higher after the recession, how long did it take to double? Um, and in other words, go up 100%. You can see to the far right, whoa, way over there, that orange line, it took almost six years for it to double. Uh, the average is somewhere around three and a half to four years. But the last two economic recoveries have been just super fast. Um, obviously, the green line, which is uh, 
what happened out of the Great Recession in 2008 and 9. Uh, that only took about two years. But look at the blue line. That was this time. Uh, that was this coming out of the, the, the very tough period of time when we had the, the shutdowns here in the United States, all the lockdowns, the stay-at-home orders. Uh, our economy went to a screeching halt. But then guess what? The markets began to, to double in only one, uh, one year, two months. Unbelievable. 14 months, by far the fastest recovery ever. Now, last year was a pretty good year for the market. 2021 was up. You know, the S&P equities uh, were up in the 20s. Um, here are all the times when markets have been up in the 20s. And then what it did the next year. Uh, and what do you note? Good times continue oftentimes. Uh, doesn't mean that that's always going to be the case. But boy, about 85% of the time, the market is positive. On average, up you know somewhere around 12% or so. We'll see what happens this year. Uh, we're negative. We'll get into that in a, just a second. Let's still talk about the good news from last year. Uh, I love this chart. What this shows is how many months in a given calendar year was there an all-time high. Um, sometimes there, you know, there wasn't any months that the market made an all-time high. Oftentimes there's one, three, five or so. But look at the far right, 12. All 12 months, the market last year hit an all-time high, hit an all-time high in January, then bettered it in February, then bettered it in, in March, and then went like that all across all 12 months, uh, really a great year last year. In fact, it was so darn good that Kentucky Fried Chicken, yeah, 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 Kentucky Fried Chicken made a law for your fireplace that you can burn, and guess what it smells like? You're right, it smells like 11 herbs and spices, just like chicken. You could actually have your fireplace smelling just like Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's how good 2021 was. They also came out with sunscreen that made yourself look like Kentucky Fried Chicken. That was great, but things turned, didn't it? Uh, if you actually look year to date, um, you can see the market, and I've got that little uh, line here, or that arrow here at the year to date, YT day, uh, YTD, year to date. Uh, you can see the market, the Dow's down about, uh, about 5% or so, that was through yesterday. Um, NASDAQ down about 11% and the S&P down about six. Now, things were decidedly worse than that. Um, you, we actually saw the, the market in correction territory uh, last week. That means uh, the market was down more than 10%, um, but it's rallied a bit last week and into this week already. Um, and so things have gotten a little bit better, but we're negative for the year. Um, and so we've started off in a hole, but here's something really interesting to note. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we had our 50, 50th day of the year, the 50th trading day of the year. Um, and and um, if you take out the recessionary years, so years like 2001 or 2008, uh, whenever the market's down more than 10% through the first 50 days, every single year, 18 of them, 18 for 18, has seen the rest of the year be positive. Now, we'll see what happens this year. We don't know. But at the end of the day, uh, through the first 50 days, it was tough. But the market is beginning to post a bit of a recovery. Now, remember, Things don't have to be great. Uh, one of the things I like to say is the market doesn't really care if things are good or bad. It just cares if it's getting better or worse. That's what it cares about. So it doesn't care if it's good or bad yet. Remember, the market began to rally even when things were awful because of COVID, because it saw that things were getting better. It wasn't good yet. It just was better. And I think what you've seen in the last few days is the market, sure, things aren't great right now. We have an invasion going on in, uh, in, in Ukraine. We have inflation. We have the Fed raising rates. We have a lot of stuff going on. None of that's really great. None of that's good. But things are getting better. And that's why the market is beginning to rally a bit here recently. The other thing I just want to note, um, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, it's a really busy slide. But, but let me build it for you. I'm going to show it to you twice. That's how much I like it. Look at all of the blue bars. Just focus on the bars first. Those are all the calendar year returns for the S&P 500. Think of that as just a good proxy for stocks. And what do you note? They go up a whole lot. <laughs> like, they go up most of the time. Doesn't mean they always go up, but they go up a lot more than they go down. This is the reason why investing in stocks, while volatile as it is, uh, is a really great way to invest for long-term investors. 
Now there are bars that go down and some that are significant. And those are in recessions. So the reality is if you're not in a recession, markets go up 90% of the time. So what you really got to figure out is, are we in a recession or not? We have more people finding jobs right now uh, than we've ever had in, in our lifetime. Um, the reality is that we are nowhere close to a recession right now. Uh, could we get there? Sure. At some point down the road, we will have another recession, but I don't think it's anytime soon. I'm going to build that case for you. Now, the second thing on this bar, uh, on this chart, is all those little dots with negative numbers. That shows you the worst pullback in every calendar year. And what do you note? Well, there's actually quite a bit of pullbacks. And on average, it's in the 13% range. On average, the market pulls back a 13% in almost every single year. Some years, not so much. Some years, a lot more than that. But always, the market pulls back uh, quite significantly. And certainly, we've had our correction greater than 10% this year. And so just not to lose sight of that level of volatility. Um, last thing, uh, this is another busy chart. But what I've got here is, um, all of the times the market pulled back at least 10% going all the way back to the 80s. First thing you know is there's a lot of, okay, the market has pulled back a lot uh, by more than 10%, sometimes 30, sometimes 20, but you see a lot of those. And, and you can see at the very bottom, that row, that is the most recent pullback. Uh, we got as bad on the S&P as down 10.3%. But what do you know at the one year and the two year returns after almost every one of those. There's a whole lot of green. Uh, in fact, the market is higher about 90% of the time. This is why staying with your investment plan, riding through volatility, and even adding to your uh, investments um, in periods of volatility is some of the very smartest things you can do. All right. So let's dive into what's going on today. What is driving the market today? And I like to call these my three eyes. Uh, one is inflation. Uh, my friends, inflation is here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure um, you are feeling it, whether it be at the gas uh, 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 tanks um, or maybe uh, at the grocery store where you're seeing the price for chicken and lettuce go up. Um, inflation is here. And we're going to talk about what that means. Number two is the invasion. Um, the, the war in, um, in Ukraine um, is uh, first and foremost a humanitarian crisis. Prayers for peace. Um, and hopefully that comes soon. Um, but it has impacts for the global economy. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what uh, Russia means to the United States and for the world's economy um, and what that looks like. And then third is inflection points. Uh, we are on the verge of uh, two major inflection points. Uh, one is the Fed is now beginning to raise rates uh, after being zero rates for a, a, a really a long time. Um, and uh, what does that mean? And two is, we're on the verge of midterm elections. I know how excited you are. You can't wait to get all those commercials from those terrible politicians. My friends, they're coming. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what midterm elections mean. All right, let's dive into the three eyes real quick and, uh, and, and, and see what we can do here. Um, so let's talk with the first one. This is inflation. Uh, my friends, um, I like to refer to inflation as the smoke from the economic growth fire. Um, what causes inflation? Now, there's lots of things that cause inflation, but, but, but what's causing this inflation primarily is demand, uh, meaning that we're approaching full employment. Everyone has a job. Everyone wants to go out to, you know, Ruby Tuesdays and, and TGI Fridays and be able to get the chicken wings and the, and the cheese curds. Um, and uh, that is not a bad thing. Um, and the supply disruptions um, are causing some issues. Uh, that's the second thing. Um, you know, you, it takes a while to restart complicated machines. Think about uh, if you didn't start your car for two years um, and then you went to go restart it again. It'd take a while for that thing to get up and running. The same is true with the global supply chain. When COVID shut everything down, that is the most complicated machine in the world is trying to think about trade and production and manufacturing. And it takes a while to get all that up and up and running again. Now, government spending did its job, whether we like it or not. And, and, and I don't, there's a lot of political views on one side and the other. But government spending did help us get out of the toughest times of COVID. That is just a fact. However, 
a, uh, a side effect of that is the fact that a lot of money went in the system and that drove prices higher, that created more inflation. Uh, and then lastly, the other eye of invasion has created uh, inflation, particularly around energy prices. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, go to this. This is uh, inflation is at the highest levels in 40 years. Um, uh, regardless of how you measure it, um, inflation is certainly a lot higher. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is how do we measure inflation? Like, like, like what is inflation? We oftentimes talk about uh, CPI, Consumer Price Index, uh, which uh, refers to a basket of goods and they track the year over year price changes for that basket of goods. And I always get asked, well, Bert, what's in that basket of goods? Like, is there eggs and, and beer and all that? Yes, there is. Uh, so for example, this is what the basket looks like. Uh, it is about a third your house uh, and rents. Um, it is about 14% food, bacon and eggs and lettuce and pork chops and all that stuff is in there. Energy is in there, things like uh, gas for both your house uh, to heat your house, but also to drive your car. Medical expenses, you can see transportation in there. Um, education, there's a whole bunch of other things, including alcoholic beverages, which is uh, about 1% of the CPI basket and recreation, uh, golf and uh, going surfing and things like that. This is the basket that we talk about. Now, what I like to refer to this is that not everyone's basket is the same. Um, you know, for example, if you have four kids and they're all, you know, in high school and college, my guess is that education basket part of your basket is a lot higher than other things, um, you know, and so forth. So this is the average across all of Americans, but it matters. Each one of our baskets are all the same or are all different uh, because our makeup are a little different. Um, and so some inflation, uh, inflation in some places are a lot worse than others. For example, food and energy is particularly high right now. Um, shelter is, a, is quite high, but not nearly as high, but you actually have negative inflation in areas like recreational commodities or in water and sewer or in household operations. That's like, I don't know, cleaning supplies. We actually have negative inflation there. So if you spend a lot of your money on Lysol, then your inflation rate isn't very high. My guess is you're not, and therefore uh, you're actually seeing some inflation. All right. One of the things that, that um, we've heard a lot about is supply disruptions. Um, and we've seen a, a lot of supply disruptions. Um, my friends, um, I love this chart here. This is the inventory of domestic automobiles. Um, like how many automobiles in the United States are there for purchase? Um, these are used cars, by the way. Um, the answer is none. <laughs> and that is why the price of automobiles are up about as high as they've been. Um, during COVID, um, no one was renting from Hertz and uh, Avis and, Amer uh, and Enterprise and all those other rental car places. So guess what they did with their cars? They sold them. They sold them overseas. They sold them to Asia. They sold them to China. They sold them to Africa. They sold them to a lot of other places because guess what? They didn't need them. And then when COVID began to uh, reduce and everybody began to travel again and wanted to rent a car and drive to you know, Disney World, guess what Hertz and Avis and Enterprise and everybody else did? They snatched up every single used car in the world. Uh, there is none left um, and we can't get, build them fast enough, my friends. Um, and so this is one of the things that's causing uh, inflation. Another thing that's causing inflation, which is a good problem to have, um, is this chart. This is a amazing chart. So let me just explain to you what you're looking at here. Uh, that blue line is the pool of available workers. So what we, uh, what the Fed does is measures how many potential Americans want a job um, that might want, that don't have one, all right? So it's the pool of available labor. These are folks that want to work, but don't have a job. Um, and you can see that, that, that it goes up and down a little bit. You see the big increase there in 2008 and nine. What happened there? The recession. We had the, the Great Recession and in the Great Recession, you had companies that had to lay workers off and you saw that available supply go up and then slowly start coming down again until you got to 2019 and 20. What happened there? Our economy ran straight into a tree. That tree was called COVID. And when that shut everything down, look at that just jumped up, just straight up like a rocket ship. The good news is it's come all the way back down. 
um, everybody that, not everybody, but most people that want a job uh, has a job. Now that orange line is an important line. Uh, that is what we call maximum employment. What that means is that every single person that wants a job has a job or could get one if they wanted to. They might turn them down, but we have enough jobs for everybody. And we are darn close to maximum employment, just about as good as it can be. Very rarely are we at those levels and that's where we are today. What does that mean? Well, it means on one side that, that businesses have to compete more for workers. So therefore wages are going up. That's the good news. The bad news is that means that because wages go up, we all have more money. And if we all have more money, guess what we wanna do? We all wanna go to Walmart and we all wanna go take a cruise and we all wanna go on vacation and we all wanna go out to eat it at Pizza Hut. And because of all those things, that's driving those prices higher because demand is up, therefore prices go up. And so all these things are causing a pull on inflation. Um, a great poll uh, that just recently came out a couple of days ago, uh, this is from Emerson College, um, and it just asked, um, with the increase in prices, is this causing problems for you and your family? You can see that uh, almost 80% have some sort of hardship based on employment. Um, in fact, 40% have significant hardships, um, and so therefore this can be problematic. Um, this is a, there's a lot to unpack in this one, and, and, and uh, this was uh, actually by Gallup. Um, what I want you to do is go to the middle column where it says worse off. And I want you to go all the way to the bottom. And what you've got here is, uh, is different uh, gradations of, of, uh, of income. Um, at the bottom there, you can get those people that make $100,000 or more. And what you're seeing is uh, what happened in 2020, 21, and 22. Um, and you can see that, that the worse off has actually gone up dramatically for those people uh, that make more than 100,000. Um, in fact, in, in, in 2000, early 2000s, right at the, just as COVID was coming on, um, only 9% felt like they were worse off relative to the year ago, a uh, year before. Today, it's a third. Uh, a lot of that is inflation. Go up to the middle class. That's the next one that's right above. People making 40 to $99,000 a year. Wow. 47% up from 18. That is a dramatic increase. This is a lot of folks that have been largely hit by inflation. Now, if you go to the very top row, um, those are those those are folks making under 40,000. So those are, are ones that, that really are, are just getting by. Um, and what you see is that this has been pretty steady. Obviously, if you're making less than 40, it's probably pretty tough to, 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 to get around and it's probably pretty tough for your family. But we have seen it dramatically increased from 2001, where that number was 56, to go down in 2022. That's because wages are up quite a bit. Um, and that's certainly helping uh, folks that make a, a little bit less. The reality is inflation is certainly biting, particularly for those uh, that are in the middle class uh, portion um, of, uh, of households, but also uh, wealthier families as well. Now here's the good and the bad news. The good and the bad news is that inflation can change and revert quickly. Uh, notice all those sort of very fast up and downs. Those are periods of time when inflation went straight up and moved straight down. Um, there is great weapons to battle inflation. And one of the ways you do that um, is to basically have the Fed take money out of the system by either raising interest rates or just physically uh, taking money out of banks. So banks have less uh, money to actually lend. And because of that, um, it slows our economy and therefore, uh, drops inflation. It's effective, but it also affects um, the pace of our economic growth. And so therefore, we got to be very careful. The Fed has to be very careful. Um, we estimate that about 90% of recessions have been caused by the Fed raising rates too much. Um, they start putting the brakes on the economy and they just never stop. And eventually the economy comes to a screeching halt and therefore it stops. We have a recession and then therefore we start all over again. What we're hoping this time is that the Fed can pump the brakes, try to battle inflation without driving us uh, to a recession anytime soon. Now, let me just, we're going to get to interest rates in a second. Um, we don't see an inflation anywhere uh, soon. Uh, certainly don't see it uh, this year. Uh, don't see it next year. Um, we really see that outwards a few years. But the biggest outside of 
an escalation uh, that's going to happen in Ukraine. We'll get that in a second. That's another I. Um, the biggest risk is that the Fed makes a policy mistake. They over tighten interest rates and slow our economic car down too much. That's the biggest risk. We think that won't happen, but it is a risk and we'll be watching that closely. Let's move to the second I. The second I is the invasion. Um, and I'll just say right here, huge prayers for peace. Um, listen, Ukraine is not a small country. Uh, Ukraine is a large, big country, but they are even bigger in their resolve. Um, so a lot of prayers uh, for Ukraine. Um, you know, Russia uh, has taken it really on the economic chin um, because of all the sanctions that have happened. Um, this is the value of their ruble. So think of this as, uh, you know, uh, our dollar. Imagine if this was our dollar and your dollar was priced at a level um, and then all of a sudden it dropped 90%. 90%. Uh, in other words, it was worth a lot less. Your dollar that used to be a dollar was then worth 10 cents, okay? 10 cents. Um, that is what's happened uh, in Russia. Um, they have seen dramatic problems. Um, these sanctions will be biting. Now, will it uh, bite nearly as much as uh, cruise missiles and some of the things that are happening from Russia in Ukraine? No, um, but over time, this will have a biting impact on the Russian economy, um, a huge impact on the Russian economy. Um, how are they battling this? Because their version of the dollar, the ruble has devalued, what's happened is they have runaway inflation. You think inflation is tough in the United States. You should see it, what's happening in Russia. Because they're not getting any trade from their partners, where are they getting new jeans or Apple watches or computers or anything else? No one's trading with them outside of China. Nobody is trading with them. And because of this, they have, not only because of their ruble to collapsing, but the lack of trade partners, run away inflation. So remember, our Fed is beginning to raise rates, and it went from zero to 0.25%. That's what our Fed just did. It went from zero interest rates to 0.25%. We're not even at 1% yet. Look what Russia just did. This is their version of their interest rates. They were at around 9% right before the uh, invasion. They increased their interest rates to 20%, my friends. Imagine if our Fed raised interest rates to 20%. That's higher than it has ever been in the history of the United States. This is where it is in Russia. Lots of problems. Now, how big is Russia? Now, militarily, they're applying their might on Ukraine and, and putting all kinds of humanitarian crises in play. But from an economic perspective, ah, they're not super important, clearly in the United States. Uh, this is how much we import from Russia. It is about 1% of our imports come from Russia. That certainly is not a lot. Now, obviously, mostly what we import from Russia is what? You were going to say oil. No, it's wheat. Wheat is number one. That is what we import more than anything else is wheat. Number two, you're right, it is oil. We, we get a lot of oil. In fact, uh, here in yellow is Russia. Russia is the number four um, um, uh, place that we import uh, oil from. This is the amount of barrels. It's about 72 million barrels. But my friends, it pales to, you know, uh, USA North, uh, which is Canada, which is where we get most of it from. And then USA South, which is Mexico. Uh, and we get a lot from the Middle East and so forth. So this is where you saw um, our government say, guess what? No more oil from uh, Russia. Is that going to be a uh, a, a pain? Sure. Did that make energy prices go up a bit? Sure. Um, but this is certainly overcomable. By uh, just getting a little more from Canada and some of our other partners, uh, this is not going to be that big of a problem. What I will say, however, is while we do not get a lot of, um, of oil from, uh, uh, that's what this is, this is oil, we do get a lot of finished gasoline. Um, about 21% of our imported gasoline comes from Russia, which means we got to up our uh, refineries to be able to get all this oil that we're getting from Canada and Mexico and Saudi Arabia uh, so that we can make our own gasoline right here in the United States. And we got to get that up and running. How big is the economy of Russia? It's 1.5% of emerging markets. 
and emerging markets is 50% of the world's economy. So cut that number in half, and that's how big they are of the overall world economy. It's under 1%, 0.7% of the economy. So therefore, we don't think that, that, that Russia is by any means going to drive this, uh, this us to a recession. We think it could create huge, huge, which it is, humanitarian crises and refugees and all kinds of problems, uh, not only in Ukraine, but also uh, the, the refugee crisis that is really happening all through Europe. Um, it's estimated that about 10 million refugees um, are out of their houses in Ukraine. That is about, that, that would end up being the ninth largest state, 10 million. Uh, that's about the size of, um, of, uh, of um, North Carolina or let's say uh, Michigan. Uh, that's how big that is. That is an extraordinary uh, humanitarian issue. All right, lastly, uh, let's think uh, about um, inflection points and uh, let's talk about those because there's a lot of changes that are coming. In order to really get control of inflation, I told you that one of the things that has to happen is that the Fed needs to raise rates. Now, by and large, rates have been declining really since uh, the 70s. I'm showing you here since the 90s, rates have been moving lower. The orange line is uh, uh, what the yield of 10-year Treasury bonds are. That has been moving lower. Um, and then the Fed funds rate, this is the interest rate that we oftentimes hear from the Fed. You can see it goes up and down, but it's on a downward sloping period and has largely been zero since 2009. Uh, from the Great Recession. It went up a little bit there in 2016 through 19, and then we promptly lowered it because of COVID. We're back at zero again, and now the Fed is just instant higher just by a smidge. Now, what a lot of people say is, well, once the Fed begins to start raising rates, isn't, the, isn't that over? Isn't that like, that's when things are going to get tough, right? No. Um, what I like to say is when the Fed begins to raise rates, that's halftime. That is half time of the economic uh, growth uh, environment. Um, and so typically half of the economic bull market after a recession or in between recessions, half of it is when the Fed is lowering rates to get out of the previous recession. Then it begins to raise rates. That's the second half of the economic uh, cycle. So you can see here, these are all the times when the Fed raised rates for the first time. What happened over the next six and 12 months Markets are up most of the time by pretty good margins. Um, this right here is the one I really like. Uh, what this shows is how much longer does the bull market continue once the Fed begins to raise rates? I love that far one to the right where it says number of years and go all the way to the bottom. It's 3.3 years. On average, that's about how much longer we have. Once the Fed raises rates, we have about three years to the next recession. Go to the next column to its left, and that is how much the market typically gives you. You have another, I don't know, 49 to 67% return, and you have about three more years until the next recession. Now, could it be a little sooner? Could it be a little later? Yes, but that is what it is on average. And so therefore, we think that that will play out again this time. Um, one thing that is getting a lot of press is the fact the Fed has said they're going to do a fair amount of interest rates this year. They, in fact, they have hinted that they would do somewhere between six and seven interest rate increases this year. Um, they have a, a total of eight meetings uh, per uh, calendar year, and they already they have one in January where they didn't do anything by rate. They didn't raise rates at all in January, um, and so therefore they had seven more. You know they raised rates just here recently, and they have six more the rest of the year of which they're predicting they will raise rates in each one of those. That would bring us to six or seven rate increases this year. So a lot of people are saying, wait a minute, isn't that a lot for a year and isn't that bad? So we went and looked and see what that meant. My friends, if it's under 10, the market takes it in stride. By and large, market takes it in stride most of the time the market's up. Now, if it's gonna be 16, or 13 or 27 interest rate increases, all right, that's a different story. But by and large, uh, we're gonna be able to likely be able to weather these in interest rate increases. Now, um, there is a bite to interest rate increases. Um, we're already starting to see that. This is mortgage rates. Um, as the Fed began to raise rates or at least hint towards raising rates and now recently did it, what happened to mortgage rates? Yep, they've been moving higher. Now, they are still low by historical standards, um, but still they're moving higher and will continue to move higher as they move rates. Um, 
we think that, again, we will see this inflection point of the Fed moving from lower rates to higher rates. This isn't a bad thing. Um, but what it is, is it's a, it's a clear marker that we are halfway, we're at the midpoint of this economic cycle. And on average, remember what that was, 3.3 more years, market's up about 50% from here. That is typically what happens, that's the playbook. So what does that mean? Stay invested, stay with your plan. The second thing, the dreaded midterm elections. Oh my goodness, I can't wait for all the commercials. Uh, what we did here in this chart, which I really like, is we took the average of every single four-year presidential cycle. So what's included in here is, uh, you know, uh, President Trump's four-year cycle, uh, both of Obama's four-year cycles, uh, both of uh, uh, Reagan's four-year cycles, and so forth and so on. Call a Clinton cycles, and you just average them together. And you say, what did the market do in all of the year one cycles, and the year two cycles, and the year three, and the year four? What do you note on here? Well, what you note is without a doubt, the most challenging year is year two. That's the one we're in right now. The midterm election year is without a doubt, the most challenging for the market. It brings a lot more volatility. In fact, um, in most of those period, the market is flat to down through about half of, the, of this year. Um, I'll show you a better chart of, of that in a second, but then it rallies late in the year. Um, and so there's lots of volatility. We'll likely to see more volatility. What's the other thing you know? Next year is the best of the four-year cycle. Without a doubt, it is the best. Why? Because it's the furthest away from another election, which we hate. We hate elections. Elections stink. And so therefore, the fact that you just got the midterms and we have two more years where you have to do another general election, for gosh sakes, let's celebrate. And that is typically the best time to invest. Markets up about 90% of the time, up about 17% return. Here I'm showing every single quarter. So every single quarter of the four, the all 16, in the green box, that is this year. That's year two. What do you note? Pretty tough the first, second, and third uh, quarters as we go through lots of volatility around midterm elections. But boy. Look at the fourth quarter into the first quarter of next year and the second quarter of next year. Looks pretty good. My point on this, these inflection points, the Fed beginning to raise rates, telling us we're midterm, us going to the midterm elections, getting ready to go through a little volatility probably. We'll probably have some choppy markets here. But man, does it look like we're setting up for seasonality to look pretty, pretty good the end of this year and into next year. Um, as really those are when usually you have wind at your back. Um, this is just another way of looking at it. Um, again, uh, we're looking at the midterm election years that I've got highlighted here. On average, on average, what we've got here is when, what is the toughest pullback on average in each one of those sort of four presidential year cycles? Well, Year two, the one we're in now, on average, markets will decline around 17% sometime. Now remember, that's average. Sometimes it's worse than that. Sometimes it's a little less than that. But on average, about 17%. We've already seen a 10% decline. Could we have something worse? Of course, that would be average. But man, look at that gray box. That is how much does the market recover after that? Woo! The very best, one of the very best times to invest is after midterm election year, in other words, this year, pullbacks in the market. That is one of the very best times to invest. We are on the verge of those. Uh, stay invested. Um, this is a time that, to follow your plan. Um, there's gonna be volatility. Uh, be careful, don't overextend, don't get too aggressive. Uh, but then what happens is as we get through the rest of this year, the wind really gets into the into our sales and the opportunity for good returns begins to happen. Um, and this is just the proof here of when you see intra-year pullbacks in midterm election years, and we got all of them here, um, man, one year later, the market has been pretty good. In fact, 100% of the time after an intra-year pullback in a midterm election year, where we are right now, the markets have been up 100% of the time on average up 30%. This is not a time to run for the hills. Uh, this, is all, this is a time to, to weather volatility and then be ready for the fact uh, that one of the very best investment periods in a four-year presidential cycle is right around the bend. 
My friends, I love this chart so much, I showed it to you again. It's to tell you that markets go up a lot more than they go down. They typically go down in periods like 2008, when it was a recession, or 2001 and two, when it was a recession, or 2019 you know, to 20, or 1981, which was a recession, or 1990, which was a recession. All the other years, those bars are going up. But it doesn't mean there's not tough times along the way. Sure there is, there's lots of volatility. That's what we mean, those are those little dots. It's an opportunity for us to stay invested. I would just end with this, a little humor. My friends, I'm pretty confident about the, the future. Now I'm not overconfident. Here's how I define it. See this guy right here? This is Jim. Jim is a builder. And actually be a builder and, and to be able to get up there and do that, it takes a lot of confidence. Now, to do that while you're standing on your buddy Jake's back, it takes a whole lot of confidence. But if you're standing on your buddy Jake's back while he is on an eight foot ladder, my friends, that is overconfidence. So let's just know the difference between being confident and overconfident. We don't be overconfident here because there's a lot of things going on. My three eyes, invasion, inflection points, and, and inflation. So we don't be overconfident, but we do want to be confident. Let's do one more. Here are two buddies, Hank and Frank. Um, they went to Walmart and got a pool at their local school and blew it up and filled it up with water. Got some alcoholic beverages and sat outside for the big game. And my friends, that takes a lot of confidence. But you are overconfident if you have an electric griddle maker in the pool with you. Now that is very confident. But it is overconfident. If you got Hank's flip-flops holding the surge protector, that is overconfidence, my friends. We don't want that, right? At the end of the day, I'm a big believer that what we're going to see here um, is a market that you can be confident in. Um, I think that, that we are midterm elections. That will lead volatility. But on the other side of that is typically pretty good investing. Um, we've got an invasion. At the end of the day, we pray for peace and it doesn't escalate. Hopefully that will happen soon. I will say the economic sanctions are severe for Russia, severe. And these will last decades uh, for that economy um, and will be cutting. Uh, make no doubt about it, it is putting pressure on them to stop. Um, as it relates to inflation, um, it will be with us for a while, but the Fed is raising rates to get that under control and doing so measuredly. We think that if all those things happen, we will avoid a recession. We are at the halftime of this economic cycle. We likely have another 3.3 years and another 50% return for the market and some brighter skies ahead as we get through the year three of the presidential election year. So with all that, I'm going to uh, take a pause and uh, turn it back over to, uh, to Eric and Carlo and, uh, and hopefully y'all are not as confident as Hank is here with uh, surge protectors uh, in the flip-flops floating in the pool. <laughs> Bert, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, not sure, if we, there we go. Uh, great themes, by the way, I've got a lot of questions about those pictures. <laughs> those were, that was amazing. But great themes, and again, uh, you know, it probably rhymes very much with what Carlo and I have been, uh, you know, talking about with our, our clients. Uh, you know, the, you, we didn't have any questions come in. You, you absolutely, you know, covered everything I think that we'd wanted to get a, across there. And, uh, you know, if you tie a few of those things together, you know, it seems like you, that we, uh, we, we understand that volatility is fairly common. Uh, but in times when we are in an expanding economic cycle, as we are as we are now, that um, you know that these these things tend to be fairly routine and work themselves out fairly quickly. Would you tend to agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent. Fantastic, uh, Car uh, Carlo. Do you want to say a few words for for um, for interest rates? Um, obviously, there's positives for it in the market too as they come up and the categories, the themes that we've looked at, are we've added financial, a financial ETF and a couple other things. Are there any areas where you feel like interest rates are gonna benefit in addition to financial services and those areas that we see rates go up? 
Yeah, um, great question, Carlo. And I think a lot of people always think about, you know, rising rates is always a bad thing, uh, you know, and you're thinking it's awful. Well, uh, let, let's think about two places. Uh, one you mentioned, um, which is financials. Um, as interest rates rise, um, you know, that uh, increases the spread for banks and other products, allows them to be able to have better net interest margins. Um, and that is a huge contributor uh, to profits. Look, when interest rates are at zero, uh, and they're and they're doing writing mortgages at one percent. Banks aren't making any money. Um, the reality is they have an opportunity for that, and so I think that's smart to be able to increase that. The other thing is consumers. What a lot of people don't realize is that we as a nation receive twice as much interest as we pay. Okay, so we pay interest on our mortgage, we pay interest on our credit cards, we pay interest on our car, but we get interest in bonds and other things as those rates begin to rise. While the prices of those securities go down, the rates go higher, we get more in our bank accounts and savings accounts and bond yields and other things. We as a nation, just say it again, we as a nation receive twice as much interest as we pay. Just go to your bank and ask them what the savings rate is uh, or the interest rate in your savings account. Zero. Um, who would like that to be higher? Well, higher rates will get that. And so the reality is that'd be a good thing. Um, you know, when you think about higher, uh, the other thing to think about with higher rates, uh, Carlo, is that generally that that lends itself uh, to periods of time when you have higher inflation and oftentimes period of, of time with high economic growth. And so an area that, that I think can benefit from that is something like industrial companies. Um, so think of that as, uh, and I'm not recommending these stocks per se, but just examples, things like Caterpillar and Deer, uh, folks that manufacture those things or commodity companies. Um, because what you're seeing here is you're starting to see um, uh, more and more um, of that begin to work. Now, we've seen commodities do quite well. I want to be careful not chasing commodities here. Um, but typically, in a rising rate environment, typically economically sensitive companies, things like that are highly tied to economic growth, uh, typically do pretty well. Um, and, and I would say something like uh, industrial material companies, mining companies and things like that, for example. Got to be careful because uh, commodities have moved a lot here recently, uh, but that's another place. But the number one place, uh, which is what you've already done, and the, the greatest uh, play in the playbook of rising rates is to buy financials. Um, we have a couple of comments. Uh, home prices, what do you think, uh, what's your forecast and what do you feel, you know, we're, we, it's interesting. And I have one other question to piggyback on the question that we got sent in. Home prices, where do you think those values are going? And what is your opinion on all these big uh, private equity investment firms investing into individual uh, housing and so on, and, and it's kind of swooping that up before the before the starter homes can get bought? Yeah. Um, so so listen, I mean, uh, home prices are up dramatically um, just across the United States. If you're on, if you're close to any oceans, uh, California, and New York, and Florida, prices are astronomically higher. Um, I think what you're going to start to see is home prices begin to moderate. Um, they're probably going to stall out here a bit and maybe move a little lower. But I got to tell you, you know, a lot of people are calling for a housing crash. I'm not so exactly sure I think you're going to see a housing crash. Um, I think that you're actually going to start to see it more moderate, might in some areas go down a little bit, but not a crash. And here's why I say that. Um, you know, we underbuilt for years. You know, go back and look at you know, the number of new houses that were built and so forth and so on, those have not um, kept up with our population by any stretch. Now, over the last five years, building permits and new houses and all that stuff has been moving higher, but we've got a ways, decades uh, to catch up there. And so I think it's going to be a while. We still don't have enough inventory for those people that want it, even at these prices, at mm -hmm. these high prices and at rising uh, mortgage rates. And so I do think that the years of, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% increases in your home value, those are over. We're not going to get those anymore. But I don't see a housing crash anytime soon. Now, the real danger will be at the next recession, three, five years from now, um, you know, there we might actually see a, a decent sized correction in house value, but I don't see it anytime soon here. Um, the next thing you asked is about these, you know, uh, big pools of money that are coming in and just swooping up all kinds of stuff. And uh, and, and, and being speculative about that. Um, I will say over the, over the short term, I'm not sure if it has a huge impact, but the long term, I think it does. 
Um, you know, you just go back to 2008 and nine, and even before that in 2000, 2001, uh, where people said, wait a minute, why am I investing in stocks? I need to have seven houses. That's what I really need. I, if I had seven houses, things would be great. And boy, that didn't pan out very well. It certainly didn't pan out for investors. Um, and my guess is it's not going to pan out for these large companies as well. Um, I do think you're going to probably see um, a little bit more government regulation in, um, in these companies being able to come in um, and do this. And, and I think that that's going to end up getting stuck with some property that, that likely they wish they didn't have. Um, but that was a long answer to a, to a short question, Carlo. I don't see a housing crash. I see prices beginning to moderate. Some areas may be back down just a little bit, uh, but the reality is there's still not enough houses for the demand that is out there. Um, now, luxury houses, big, big, big houses, people are downsizing and you're seeing more and more people downsize. You're likely to see that area to be the most vulnerable. But when you're talking about houses that you know, are, are in the more you know, uh, middle income tiers, I think you're gonna see uh, uh, those home prices hold up pretty well for a while. Great, thank you. Um, someone asked, so, uh, can you summarize the top indicators of, of a recession coming? Yeah, uh, I, I love this question. Uh, so so when, you, when you're thinking about what do you look at, uh, at, at what might happen for a recession? So there's a couple of, um, of things that I like to look at very closely. So let me, let, let me tell you one of them. Um, one of them, um, is when there's something called the Index of Leading Economic Indicators, um, LEI. Basically, it is uh, a basket of, three, uh, I think it's eight um, different economic indicators, um, and they pull them all together and they create an index. Uh, almost every time that that index year over year is turned negative, you have had a recession within six months. It is one of the single greatest um, indicators of a recession to come. Now it's had a couple of false positives, meaning it's gone negative and then not had a recession, but it's never not gone negative and not had a recession. Does that make sense? Did I say that right? Uh, it's gone negative and not had a recession, but every time it, but, but every time we've had a recession, it has been negative. That's what I've been saying. All right. So that's number one. The other one is when you have a significantly inverted yield curve, meaning that short-term yields uh, typically are less than long-term yields. Um, but when that begins to invert, which we're getting close to inversion for the two to 10 year treasury, but not for the three month to 10 year treasury. Um, and so we're nowhere close to that. But to watch that, if we have long-term inversion, that is a sign that the bond market is telling you to be careful. So I watch uh, yield curve inversions and I watch the leading in um, LEI, you know, the uh, index of leading economic indicators those are the two uh, ones for me. If I had to throw one more in that no one looks at but me, is rail traffic. My friends, if you want to know how things get from A to B here in the United States, it is on rail traffic. Um, this is my very first job in this industry 30 years ago, was I worked for a gentleman and I used to go to the train station, I'd sit in a chair and I'd count the number of cars on a train. And I would write it down and come back and tell them. And if that number was going up, the economy is doing great. And if that was going down, that means the economy was starting to not do so great. And we counted that, and that was one of the very best indicators. Now, I don't have to do that anymore because someone else does that for me. But I still track that very closely. And if you could look at it, you can just Google it, uh, rail traffic and now uh, truck traffic. Um, that is another one that is an early canary in the coal mine for recession. Do you think... Um... We had one question about businesses, but I think we covered it. As far as we looking at businesses, we're looking more at financials and some other categories. Um, one of the things that, you know, a few years ago, I think you and I were talking about is just the demographics and the, the echo boomer. And the, the, you know, one thing you can look back at the market and you look at the boom of the 90s and you look at the boom we've had more recently, it's been because of uh, major demographic moves where they're getting into that 30 to 50 range, which is the sweet spot of buying stuff. You know, for all the millennials talked about, they weren't going to buy anything. Now they're very upset that housing prices are out of reach and they're, and all of a sudden they want to buy. And I think, you know, it kind of gets rebranded. You know, everybody says, you know, our generations would say, 
oh, we wanted to take a gap year, we want to go you know, travel around Europe. And theirs was we wanted experiences, just a different way of saying it. And, and as you mature, you start going, well, now I have you know, two kids and I want to buy a house. So mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you feel as far as looking at those as you know, kind of a, how the wave affects the markets over the long term? Yeah, look, demographics are what drive uh, our economy. Uh, there's just no doubt about that, right? Um, what our economy is, when you think about it in general, is hundred, you know, several hundred million people, and it's their behavior. And if we're all scared, that causes recessions. If we're all excited, we go buy stuff. You know, if we're having lots of babies and things are growing, if we're getting older, then we know that we're buying more hips and medicine. If we're getting younger, we're buying more video games. Like everything is driven by demographics. Um, there's a lot of interesting trends here. Um, Carlo, and you and I, you and I have talked about this a million times. We've spent hours and hours talking about this. This, let me just go through a couple of interesting ones. Uh, one of them is family size, but we're having less kids. Um, we've been having less kids for 70 years. Uh, there used to be, you know, 3.5 or so kids per adult uh, female in the United States. Now that's down to below 1.7. What does that mean? If we had less kids 40 years ago, that means there's less working aged adults today. That is what we see. Um, one of the things that scares me a little bit is that our population growth has been declining. We saw double digit population growth in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Then that declined to high single digits in the 90s and 2000s. And now it looks like it's going to be in the low single digits, three to 5% population growth for the, last, for the next couple of periods. Um, and so that means that we don't have enough workers and we have a fairly restrictive immigration policy. And so that means that, well, we don't have a lot of folks here for the jobs. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you're seeing inflation and other things. Um, and so that's one demographic trend. Another demographic trend, like you said, is that um, you're seeing more and more folks have uh, that extended period of time uh, of working. Look, we, you know, you don't need to uh, go out and, and have a, you know, work the farms anymore. You know, I mean, Carlo, you and I are old. We can't go out and work the farms. And if you and I try to use a shovel, we throw it back out. But guess what? You can sit at a desk and wear a nice jacket and you can work until you're, you know, 80 and 90, you know, so can I. So the reality is that we're going to be working longer. What does that mean? It means our wealth is going to go up. What does that mean? We're going to spend more. We're going to buy more. Um, and so the reality is you're seeing the wealth effect really drive um, a lot of things, particularly where wealth is, California, New York, Northeast, Florida, you know, around Chicago, um, you're seeing an extraordinary amount uh, of buying and so forth. And the last demographic is that, you know, maybe our lifetime, Carlo, but definitely our kids' lifetime, leading, leading cause of death will soon be falling down the steps. You know, we will lick terminal diseases and you will live until you fall down the steps. Um, you know, that's just what's gonna happen. And so the reality is that's gonna change the way people live, the way they spend, the way they invest, the way they work. All these are great demographics. And man, I, I, I think the more that, that we understand the demographics of the United States and what it looks like and the diversity and all the waves that comes and goings, the better you can understand sort of the longer term things. Last point on this. Um, I oftentimes like to refer to this as uh, like the ocean. Um, there are waves, there are tides, and there are currents. And everyone likes to focus on the waves, you know, the big waves crashing in the shore and stuff. And that's like, you know, uh, a tough day in the market or a tough month in the market. And the way the tides, those are these economic cycles that we were talking about, midterm election years and things like that. Demographics, those are the currents. What drive the oceans are currents. And the more you can focus on currents, the better you can understand this economy and the market. Thank you. Well, well, we have one, we have one, word we have one last question, right but we're up against our time. So I'll, I'll call that person and answer it. I think I know your answer, but we'll call directly. But these are the conversations that we have on an ongoing basis to yep. make sure that we understand where to put the wind in the sails for our clients and make sure their, their, their investments are kind of tied to their planning. And this, this, this meeting could go on for hours if we all had the... Uh, the time and our and our clients have the patience, but really want to uh, you know thank you, Bert, for your time today and your friendship and your partnership, and to everybody on the call for your trust and your confidence in your partnership. And we're here for any questions, and we hope to continue to put on what we hope you found to be a valuable uh, uh, forum like this for for conversation through good times and bad. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Bert. Thanks so much.
बाय बाय